Scott reminded me that last time he was here, in, in uh, uh, ten years ago or so, uh, I, I was lucky enough to introduce him. Uh, and uh, luckily also, I have to write a different introduction because a lot has happened in those ten years. Uh, among those things, uh, Scott's now the Gerald M. McHugh Professor in Architecture and the Chair of Architecture at Harvard's Graduate School of Design, uh, where he also has coordinated first-year studios for years, many years. Uh, and the design problems that he's devised there are, and I don't think I'm exaggerating, uh, are legendary uh, for their elegant and ingenious uh, way of introducing formal and spatial logics while simultaneously demanding uh, creative solutions. Scott's the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including first prize uh, in the International Competition for the Robbins Elementary School in Trenton, New Jersey, uh, the Academy Award in Architecture from the American Academy, American Academy of the Arts and Letters, three Progressive Architecture Awards, uh, uh, he's the author of Contested Symmetries and Other Predicaments in Architecture, as well as a forthcoming book titled Permutations of Descriptive Geometry. His work is widely published uh, and is collected in numerous collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the Fogg Museum at Harvard, uh, and others. Uh, exhibitions include National Design Triennial at the Cooper Hewitt in 2007, uh, three appearances at the Venice Biennale, uh, he participated in Intricacy at the ICA at, at uh, University of Pennsylvania, and the Unprivate House Show at the Museum of Modern Art uh, in 1999. He's uh, uh, in demand as a teacher as well. He was the Frank Gehry International Chair at the University of Toronto five years ago, and the Perloff Professor at UCLA in 2002. So all of those achievements are only in the past 10 years, at least maybe 95% of them. But his teaching and work have been influential since at least the mid-1980s, uh, just a few years after he graduated from the GSD. Uh, today I went back and read a 1990 essay on two of Scott's early pre-digital projects, an essay by Bob Somel who wrote that Scott's work was, quote, content to capitalize on rather than challenge or criticize the discourse of autonomous form. According to Somal, the objects tend to exist as skillful but purely formal games that might be accused of being, you know, scandal of all scandals, too easy. Now, nearly 20 years later, this is interesting because for the last six, or six years or so, Somal has been advocating and supporting work for precisely the reasons he once dismissed Scott's. So a dozen years before the cool and the easy became topics of contemporary theorists like Somal, Levin, Allen, Kipnis, and Whiting, Scott was already doing it. And even more amazing and tantalizing is this. He has a more substantial claim on one of that crowd's catchwords uh, than they do, projective long before projective practice was embraced as a successor to critical practice, Scott was deeply immersed, you might even say obsessively interested, in systems and techniques of projection, or what is often called projective geometry. What I'd like to say is Scott's work was prescient in that it has always been literally projective. In the, last, in, in the latter 1990s, his work took a turn from manual delineation based primarily in projective geometry and committed to the autonomy of the architectural object or the replication of those procedures and commitments through digital means. And he began instead to directly engage the nascent potential of digital production. And, and three houses that I, I assume uh, many of us know well, designed between 1997 and 2000, the Terminal Lines Project, the Taurus House, and the Wu House, transfer his prior formal interests towards a different kind of autonomy, the black box of information technology. He began to work directly with modeling software to identify techniques of delineation and description that are no less rigorous or sophisticated than those of descriptive geometry. But the aim was no longer, as in the earlier work, to determine fundamental architectural knowledges and devices, but rather to exploit the indeterminate potential of digitally produced form. <coughs> 
His more recent projects continue that approach, including several large-scale built works now underway, the soon-to-be-completed Tel Aviv Museum, and two projects in China, the Nanjing Performing Arts Center and the Taeyuan Museum. As you will see in those projects and in the way he describes them, Scott's work investigates the pleasures, even the joy of discipline, in his case, specifically architectural geometries and modes of projection and delineation. That very commitment and focus has the effect of permitting immense license, but also ensuring the work's significance. Uh, please join me in welcoming Scott Cohen. Well, thank you, Mark. It's really a pleasure to have you introduce me again um, and uh, to speak so, about so many interesting things. Very, very interesting. And I'd like to thank John Yoder and Mark Robbins for inviting me here. It's really great to be back here. I've been here quite a number of times and I've always liked to come. It's a great school. I really see it as one of the great, strong schools that still teaches to the core uh, the disciplines. Um, so, indeed, some such things I will speak about. Um, though the title of the talk was something like um, tectonics and geometry, actually that turns out to be a kind of subtitle to uh, a number of things I want to talk about that are built around this theme of attenuation, uh, which I believe characterizes much of the projects. Um, and basically this is an idea I think you all understand very well. It, but it refers not only to proportional uh, distortion as it inheres in form, but also to the question of duration, the experience of temporality in architecture by the occupant and by extension, different degrees of attention and inattention in architecture, levels of consciousness or indifference to architectural form and space. So attenuation establishes a very interesting interface between geometry and form in architecture and the social forms of interaction within buildings. Um, and so, of course, I, therefore, I, I regard it to be very important. And so what I'm going to do tonight is to try to talk about the projects in terms of these four aspects of attenuation that I'm kind of preoccupied with recently. Um, and you can see them there. <laughs> and I will begin with the first of these. Uh, by kind of going back, well, in each case I will, to some references of importance uh, that have guided the thinking in the projects. Uh, of course, this, the most classic example of the question of anamorphosis in the painterly medium. Um, and it, of course, defines a very extreme condition where a perspective is distorted uh, when seen frontally, but from a very oblique position in space is seen correctly. It's a kind of superimposition of a frontality and obliquity, uh, simultaneously kind of the, uh, the primary view and the very marginal. Um, and the marginal becomes, you know, uh, very explicit and important where otherwise it would not have been recognized. That is, that we, don't, we accept distortions when we're looking at images from peripheral positions, but normally that view isn't made explicit. Now, this moves into architecture in a certain very indirect way, I would argue. Um, you could say that somehow there is a relationship between architecture and the perspective, as embodied, of course, in Alberti's architecture, where the grid substantiates the perspectival space. But uh, in the Baroque example, which has some connections to the anamorphic, uh, where explicit distortion becomes important. It isn't so much a perspectival distortion that happens, but a kind of complete uh, modification, uh, distortion of the, in the whole of the object, not only uh, regarding a perception, but in fact, the entirety of the work. Um, it's not so much something that tries to organize uh, the reception as to alter the object. Uh, and we can carry this all the way into the present this is a stopping at a, a peculiar point in the mid-century, the last century, an architect, Miguel Fisac, who also is caught up in the question of the distortion. But here, not so much uh, regarding the earlier models of form against which we can see the distortion very clearly and explicitly. Here, the whole volumes of space are drawn into 
this matter of, of, of uh, distortion. In this case, uh, uh, representing a kind of elasticity. Now this whole idea of the elastic uh, dimension of architecture is absolutely essential to the problem of attenuation, the sense that things literally stretch or are in a dynamic state of change. Um, and that, of course, has to do with our perception, but also is somehow embodied, uh, represented in the form itself in these cases. <coughs> Taking this into another domain, concurrent with these kinds of uh, projects in the 20th century, um, another idea of attenuation. It isn't explicitly represented in the shape language, but through diagonal sequencing of space, uh, through the ramp and the uh, extended threshold that is developed by Corbusier through the promenade uh, or in Los, where very, very complex interactions of space establish uh, different durations uh, between them. And there are many very intricate perspectives and experiences developed therein, which are off-axis, uh, multi-directional, a kind of non-orientable kind of space is somehow latent in the Lowe's model. Um, and these two models uh, we know have been compared are absolutely important in thinking about how this idea enters into a kind of social uh, condition in, in, in our experience. Um, jumping into my work, what, what, how could you take this question about attenuation to a different extreme? I would say what happens in the Los and the Corb is that you have a condition in which the promenade, the passage, the experience of movement itself now is very definitive of the whole, of the whole work. Here, taking it even further, it is, the whole building is only a threshold. Uh, in this particular case, this house, the, the whole building is something like the interval in a threshold, like the thickness of a wall through which one passes. All of that space is scooped out. It's like an emptied out interior of that kind of uh, wall-like condition. But of course, it's horizontal, which makes it even more indirectly a reference. But the idea that you pass through it is made so clear by this void at the center, which allows one to uh, ascend to the roof which becomes a space of entertainment, very important for this country house, for this painter who mainly works on the roof painting and entertains there. The private dwelling is passed by, much like we do in those summers when we're invited to parties and passing through a house which is empty, uh, turning, turns the entirety of the house into that kind of interval in the threshold experience of moving to the backyard. Here we do it by moving to the roof. Um, so this, this is not only a matter of the vortex and the geometry that uh, is, is developed around the idea, but uh, has a great deal to do with how one lives in, in a villa of this kind. Another example is a kind of rectified version of that. Uh, you could say a, a rectified toroidal form. Here the void is horizontal. The whole house a threshold to that backyard space, to that view. Um, that becomes a very interesting experience, a promenade through the, the house. Uh, and it also does many of the most interesting things that happen, uh, both in this and the Taurus house, when you take the idea of the threshold and make the entire work dedicated to constructing it. It creates very peculiar relationships between interior and exterior, whereby everything outside and everything inside are utterly divided, uh, separated, coexistent though by their uh, constant um, uh, contiguity, um, which is expressed again and again in apertures, which make all the more evident the distinction between the two realms of space. So while this would seem to be the most interior, the most centered of all of the spaces, of course, it's actually the, the exterior. And the exterior has the characteristics of something too refined to be at this scale rendered as such. So here, for example, we have four inch planks of cedar, which in that dimension, seeming to be so fine, uh, in a way, given the way it has aged, uh, refer to the idea of boardcrete, cast in place concrete. It's very interesting that these transformations occur when we 
look at the problem of scale and the tightness of a surface and depending on the materiality, many other references come into play. I think it's particularly, particularly striking here because the irrational distribution of the windows, I should say structurally irrational distribution of the windows relative to members as we see them through the windows, uh, re represents a kind of freedom to place them independent of structure. And given this fine grain dimension of the wood, um, it begs the question of its materiality. I've had people ask me, in fact, how I managed to build a concrete villa of this scale, scale in the mountains of New York. Um, gives me great pleasure to hear that question, um, when in fact it's cedar. So here we, uh, we, we recognize how this dynamism of the voiding of the plan with this corridor, which really turns out to be a bridge suspended over another space, uh, captivates the, ca captures a kind of uh, strange sense of circularity and movement in this, in this otherwise what would be more regimented and structured space. Um, now to go to another question of how attenuation is developed. Probably the most inspiring source of these conditions is, is the site, which in many cases uh, brings about inventions, very uh, let's <laughs> original and very peculiar inventions have been brought by the problem of the constraining site. Here, what we see is this very classic case of the Church of Bramante in Milan, in which having to realize a centralized plan, um, a Latin cross, in a site which precluded that possibility because of a street that was adjacent to the back side, uh, the architect resorts to a device which is to construct an artificial perspective to represent the idea that this is a centralized church to manifest that fourth uh, part uh, utterly in an illusory way. Um, so what we see, of course, is that a view on the right of the anamorphic uh, rendition. And from the, on the left, we're seeing the correct view of this illusion. Um, it's, it, it interests me most to imagine that it isn't only the artful and persuasive development of the anamorphosis that's of interest, but that it is, in fact, the pressure to manifest a very particular form for a very particular set of social conditions that, that demanded that form, and to have a situation which doesn't permit that it be manifest, and that in the conflict between the demand and the constraint uh, is born this ingenious solution to import the painterly uh, anamorphosis into the architectural condition. Uh, so it's an unprecedented importation at that moment, but it is not only willful, it is solving a problem. And this is very attractive for a 20th century architect, to solve a problem ingeniously, uh, rather than to introduce formal invention for its own sake. I can't argue this is always what I am doing because we don't have forms today that we are required to make and that therefore by virtue of not being allowed to, we will invent solutions for. So we will have to make those up for ourselves if we wish to proceed in that way, which is in a way what I do. I invent forms that would with only difficulty be possible, negotiate them with contexts and situations, um, and then they transform and then they alter both those conditions and they, those forms themselves be, are changed throughout these processes of thinking about these uh, possible conflicts and these new resolutions to conflicts. This is one of the ways I, I work this out. So here we will see a project which is constrained in a very odd way by a, an irregularly shaped site, very dense with many restrictions bearing on it. And I'm trying to relieve that density uh, by extracting a tower from it rather than having it just be all deep and very bulky in a constant way and voiding at the center with a courtyard. Um, and e even taking that further, and we can see here how the shape of the site is guiding uh, this, uh, this particular project where it's at the turn and the grid and a very odd curvature is introduced. This is a student center and performing arts center for Nanjing University, a new university campus outside the city 
So what we'll see is that this dialectic between this tower and this map building is resolved by creating a kind of continuous spiral-like form which rises out from the mat and develops into the tower. Um, the, the body of the building is a kind of continuous surface, at least it, it suggests it is, um, which breaks in very, uh, you know, kind of strategic ways for various functions that are plugged into this building. It's a very complex building programmatically, as we will see in a little while. But um, the point is that somehow through these, uh, these surfaces that have a kind of pliable geometry, there is a, a potential to adjust and modify as one is working out this problem, but to keep always coherent the set of sets of relationships that are absolutely dedicated to a certain kind of consistency, uh, despite their elastic dimensions, and to embody a very uh, disparate uh, kind of uh, social uh, project with, with uh, a single form that gives some kind of legible presence to a building that has a, a, a great significance in this campus. Uh, most of the buildings are very kind of devoid of any specificity of any s distinctive forms, and they were asking very specifically that within very limited constraints, economic constraints, that this building be given an expressive force. Um, it's a very homogeneous building. All of it is ceramic tile, except for the tower and a few very dramatic cuts that are glazed. Um, and it's remarkable to exploit, as it were, the potential to use certain kinds of technologies that are very primitive in a way, like the tiling of these vast surfaces to achieve uh, interesting effects. The tiling indeed is articulated to define the form in a way to reaffirm the spiral-like shaping by having its tonal value change according to a kind of uh, constant uh, rotation from dark to light to dark again. Um, and so it is casting always a shadow, a kind of chiaroscuro, almost like the building is always in the state of being rendered, uh, despite the grayness of the weather there. And its reflectivity, of course, enhances this. Another project where the constraining site is so significant. This is a project in downtown in Manhattan very near the uh, site of the World Trade Center. Um, it is just to give definition provisionally to a space that otherwise would be a canyon lost in its darkness, <laughs> caught between two very unattractive buildings. Well, one presumably not unattractive, the other quite unattractive. And, uh, and it is caught there in a very strange and interesting way by virtue of the fact that the space there, and you can see it, uh, is here, and uh, now there is a tower there. Um, it, is, it is a passage which bends in a very particular way, which when one imagines that this would be a very straightforward structure that simply cantilevers off the new tower, uh, creates some difficulties in terms of trying to be uh, straightforward about that kind of continuity. Uh, because of the bend, uh, this, this element will, by its own nature, uh, be required to fold and, or turn accordingly. But the, the, what I introduce is a kind of counterintuitive uh, imperative that it be a straight shot through. And this is just what one cannot do here, make a straight shot. And you see then that I get myself into the question of how to negotiate. Uh, this is counterintuitive for another reason as well, which is that normally these canopies, as a paradigm in Manhattan, are all about articulating successive bays as one proceeds through to register the perspective and the diminution of the bays gives one a sense of distance and uh, measures the space and articulates bays for retail. This is doing something else which is accentuating uh, a continuity that isn't really there, creates a very interesting and warped space visually, even though it's, uh, it's made of only three surfaces, three planes, and it tends to create an experience of shortening and lengthening in various ways, making this passage very elusive and very uh, unexpected. Um, 
It extends also the floor from the inside, which is at that level the trading floor for Goldman Sachs, and it's one of the largest open floor plates in the city. This is the reason the site was chosen, in fact, by Goldman Sachs, that it would allow for such a large floor plate. So you see, again, how a motive, how a constraint like that is so important, the need for such a large plate, floor plate. And so this extends it visually, and it represents, imagine, in a way that that floor were to extend and being uh, ab uh, somehow obstructed by the very unattractive building across the way, uh, which the, and indeed Goldman Sachs regards to be a, real, a really serious eyesore problem, this building on the left. Goldman Sachs is very frustrated by it. Uh, it represents, in a way, the, the building as an obstacle to this uh, otherwise, uh, let's say, the surface that otherwise may have been able to lay, lay horizontal. Um, and so in a way it gives presence to that building as a force acting on the space rather than having one recognize it only as an uninvited guest. In a way it gives more strength to it but as a mass rather than as an image. Um, so the idea of turning that building, the, the, the red building, into a kind of tectonic force is one of the desires here. The glazing that here is going on to the ceiling will be the most important final element because it will give reflectivity to a surface that in a way produces manifold perspectives. It's linear, it's multiply, and it, be, it exceeds the three surfaces by virtue of that reflective surface. It exceeds its geometry. Interesting, despite how simple it looks, despite the fact that this project is only three triangles manifesting a continuous kind of torquing of a, of a surface in space. Uh, every one of its structural elements is unique. It's a very complex kind of problem to build this very simple thing because the oblique surfaces on the top and the bottom are not ever able to be parallel. Um, another project which deals with limitations of scale, I would say with reference to what I said about the Goldman Sachs trading floor, this is just the opposite problem. Um, of all of the Ordo sites, um, <laughs> a very funny anecdotal story, I was there selecting with all of those who were participating in this project, which was a hundred houses, and we were asked to draw from a hat our site choice, and with a friend, Craig Scott of Scott and uh, Imamoto, a very good architect, he was expressing great anxiety about the choice that he would end up with. He had selected already that there were five good sites and that many were not, and then there were some terrible sites. So I said to Craig, I said, Craig, let's identify the very worst sites so that we're ready for it and that we can take it, no matter how bad it gets. So let's go up there. We analyzed the site plan. We got it down to four. We got it down to three. And finally, we were able to establish which of the 100 was the worst site, the least exposure, the smallest, uh, and uh, in a very bad relationship with surrounding houses, uh, lacking topo to any topographic deviation. It's the only site that had all of these detrimental characteristics. Craig Scott picked one of the five best, and I, after many people picked their houses, of course, selected this one, the worst one. And of course, it's the only one that I can work with. Because I find it very frustrating in the end to have a site which leaves me with many choices to make. I much prefer being uh, jammed, jammed into a corner. At first I was very unhappy about this, but I realized this was the right site. It forced me to bury the whole house, uh, to have the very large house that they demanded. I asked that they allow me to reduce the program from the 10,000 square feet to something more like five that would fit here better, and they would not allow it. They would only allow me to go down to 9,500 square feet. So I pushed the house below and, and made a very, uh, um, what I would call, diminutive scale, uh, sized tower, which has kind of a monumental aspiration by virtue of its miniature uh, characteristics. Um, so this small tower becomes the private villa. The program had been divided between a small, I mean, a private part and a, a very kind of uh, in entertainment dedicated area, uh, which was much larger. And I made the entertainment villa, this, the, the part below grade, with two large courtyards 
And it's the connection, of course, between this tower that's in a way adrift uh, without moorings in this uh, very uh, arid landscape surrounded by other much more powerful and larger houses, uh, which uh, by virtue of retreating and being the smallest of all of the houses, uh, creates this sense in a way of, uh, of greater monumental aspiration. This inversion was of great interest to me. Of course, there are all these questions about the geometry, the sun angles, the <laughs> being true to a certain calculus of structure that could allow it to tilt in a very particular way, which is connected directly to the dimensions, again, elastic by implication, the dimensions, the variable dimensions, I should say, of all of the programs for swimming and, and other things that are uh, at the base, and trying to distribute courtyards in an unsta unstable way, which will make more, less evident that one is in an underground world when one is in those spaces of surrounding those courtyards. Um, and then, if I were to talk about the site, I would say the two museums clearly also have so much to do with this problem. Here we have the exact opposite problem, uh, an unbound, a site which will not bind or delimit the shape of the building, which will do nothing to help me define it. Uh, this is much more distressing, um, actually. And so one has to invent entirely the entire, uh, the, uh, the idea for the site. And what I did is to try to integrate and to make a park out of this building. Uh, in fact, there are promenades that weave through it so that one can experience uh, sculpture gardens and uh, many of the uh, spaces that are able to be um, accessed by the public without entering the building so that the building partakes in constructing uh, this park that belongs to the larger uh, surrounding uh, cultural center that this will be part of. Most of the building stand as objects and are rather mute and indifferent. And I had very much in mind the idea that this would uh, be much more a part of this continuous, uh, as I said, park, which will be a place for leisure uh, movement, uh, not heavily populated this park, but a place of retreat uh, from the surrounding office uh, parks uh, around this very low density cultural uh, center. The building is developed uh, according to its own kind of coherent geometry, which was a knot, a kind of trefoil knot that was doubled. Um, but then uh, the form of the building rose out of other procedures and the acceptance of a very interesting uh, problematic interior, which I will describe in just a moment. Let me go to one of the other themes, that of the plan. Um, I think here you, you, what I really wanted to show you only is the way in which the force of movement through the building and the connection between the, the park space and the interior becomes uh, the main uh, theme of the building. Um, like the Nanjing building, the skin is very taut, uh, representing a kind of interesting uh, interface between two mutually exclusive domains, the inside and the out. And finally, of course, the site was so strong, again, in, in this case, the, in the Tel Aviv Museum, where uh, basically, uh, the, the question was about how to put uh, a museum which would need to mainly be the rightful place for exhibiting art, and that means being very conscious of the kind of curatorial freedom that was desired by this museum, by this museum's curators. Um, while dealing with this highly idiosyncratic condition of the site. Um, there's something very clear about that, I mean, in a way, the, the demand, that the galleries be very simple and that they be rectangular, that they be highly flexible to offer that curatorial freedom, but at the same time, the client is desiring too many of them to fit in this site, and then asking that these rectangles be put in a triangle moreover. I thought, this is just the kind of project for me <laughs> and I knew that this was the right one, despite all obstacles seeming to be going against 
against us, we were able to prevail and take this competition. Uh, mainly, I think, because the problem was so specifically uh, right, right for the kind of work I wanted to do. Uh, it's an interesting moment where the fit is, is what it is all about. Um, here we're in the center of a, a, a cultural center. Again, the last open site, as I said, a kind of strangely nearly triangular shaped site. And the building has many pressures whirling around it. Let's say, well, parks and circulation that are always very near its edge. One doesn't ever approach this building frontally. One sees it only in an oblique way. Uh, it's very close, therefore, to this idea of the anamorphic that we talked about. So here we have this question of the rectangular forms of galleries uh, and, and put it on a site which they're not compatible with. And the idea here was also to deal with another fundamental difficulty, which was that the building was by necessity going to need um, a lot of light uh, to uh, enter in spaces that are quite well below the, the, the main entry, the plaza level. Half the building submerged. Um, and so there was this idea that there would be this light, light well uh, and that this space would find a way to organize the experience for everyone in the building and that the galleries would, would basically be rotating around it, um, defined as they would be by the surrounding site pressures angled in relation to different conditions in the site. And that this interior would, in a way, be made by the forces of the site outside. So it's a kind of, again, an inside-out project, or outside-in, I should say, outside-in, like the Taurus idea, um, but uh, here it's an element of, in its own all its own. And it is embedded in a building, if you look at the top image, in which the exterior is playing out a very similar uh, kind of uh, set of problems um, differently. Imagine this was a building which was very heavy, full as it is with so many rooms and things, <laughs> and that it is somehow trying to capture all of those forces there is a kind of rotation implicit in it as one winds around that light well. There's the sequence is basically winding one around it. And the outside one perambulates very near the edge of the building in order to enter all of those spaces uh, around it. So mainly I'm speaking about a kind of entrance. This is a kind of important promenade. And one descends a ramp here and comes down this way into the sculpture garden. And on the other side, there's a very important path that winds around and brings you into the building from that side. And so the pathways that hug the building tightly, which are, as it were, more attenuated, they're much longer on the outside of the building, are also defining this rotation, just as the inner, much more, uh, uh, let's say, much quicker paced uh, ascent uh, defines the, uh, just as that quicker paced uh, ascent, ascending series of ramps, defines the inner. So it's a kind of fast motion, slow motion from the inside to the outside, a heavy wheel turning very slowly on the outside, very, very slowly, very slightly, whereas it's wound up very tight at, at the heart in the, at where this courtyard is, where this light well is. Um, you see, of course, that I'm rehearsing something related to the Fisac but here in an inversion where he made exteriorized volumes of glass rotate with respect to one another and with these hyperbolic paraboloids connecting them. This happens here only on the inside, it's a kind of inside out of that. Um, and it's eccentrically shaped mine, uh, not symmetrical uh, in rational version that we see in the case of, of Fisac. This is a variable and more complex geometry that I'm working on here with many consequences in the construction, by the way, um, that would not be faced by Fisac because his were standard forms with repeatable uses of the formwork. And we see the connection to this very important precedent, the Guggenheim of Frank Lloyd Wright, where this idea of a developing sequence of an itinerary uh, being very definitive of an interior exhibit space um, plays out around an open space, but 
in a certain way, in a very clear way, uh, is running interference with curatorial freedom. Um, this is a museum around which only very particular kinds of responses could be uh, uh, introduced by artists and curators. Uh, the goal in this, in my museum, is not to uh, interfere in any way, by the way, uh, not even in a subtle way, with the curatorial uh, spaces. Um, and so they are adjacent to this well of space. For example, there is a gallery running along that edge. It's a, it's a rectangular gallery. There's another one parallel to it up here. At every one of these levels, either across from the ramp or immediately adjacent, adjacent to the light, light space uh, is a gallery uh, with a normative geometry. Of course, there is always uh, present the memory of something like this great <coughs> space. Um, I would hope that memory would be there. The Fairmini Church, where concrete plays such a, a role in creating this very tactile experience of light traveling uh, downward. Okay, now to switch to a theme of, of a very different kind, but that I believe is of great importance in all of these projects, uh, the question about how the formative um, concepts play out in the plan. Uh, there's a problem of ten attenuation in the plan, uh, but it, and it began, as I said, let's say you could, in this century, with Corb and Los. But I'd like now to talk about it in an almost cliche way, if you will bear with me, by trying to draw a parallel between the plan and the filmic medium, film. Um, because I think it actually explains something interesting about what I regard to be three models of plans that are presently very important in architecture. Uh, the first model of the plan that I want to talk about is the anatomical plan. The idea of a plan which cuts through a pre-established figure um, and is, you could say, uh, representing that figure in successive cuts that are in, have no particular relationship to that form of space. Uh, that is, any one of these plans is of no particular value. They are arbitrary slices relative to the figure. Now, this idea, if we were to uh, think about it in relationship to the filmic medium, we're looking at something like a kind of continuous gestalt of form sliced successively. These could be frames in a continuous film. Uh, imagine that this kind of successive uh, series of plan slices I'm referring to is something like that. Um, and skewered vertically, uh, let's say, by the elevator or anything that has to do that. Uh, that is somehow analogous to the linear narrative that, pull, that holds together every one of those successive frames or is uh, related to the principal ray, which is the view of those successive, uh, it, it cuts through every one of those successive frames in a, in a film. So what we're seeing is, that, you know, I'm talking about the axis of vision being related to the vertical axis of the elevator in the, in the in architecture. So what we see here is this idea that the denial of a rectilinear frame of reference in architecture, uh, along with the continuous circulatory movement, as we see in Frank Lloyd Wright, for example, uh, produces a kind of pre-montage condition of film, uh, constitutes this analogy of normative, continuously narrative film. Uh, now, that, that's an interesting thing to think about because if it's, if it's true, what I'm saying, or if it has some viability, it means that at its most extreme architecture, and this is very rare that we have buildings like this, despite how popular they are today uh, in the media and in, in the academy, the buildings of this kind of form, of continuous form, like the Yokohama Port Terminal, for example, are very rare in the world. But they are, despite how rare they are, the most like conventional film. <coughs> they are purely narrative, linear, uh, in the sense of the treatment of the form and in terms of its coherence. And in their relationship to the plan, um, they manifest that model of straightforward pre-montage film. 
Um, I like that. I like the inversion that architecture at its most radical is in the filmic medium it, most conventional. Um, now I'm going to show you a, a couple, two more models that I think play out in a, in a more interesting way in architecture. The first is uh, what we would call sleep, named after Warhol's film that you all know, in which for about eight hours nothing is seen but a man, uh, Warhol's boyfriend, sleeping. Uh, just that. Uh, we do see uh, some quivering. We do see some of the movement that one sees when one is sleeping, but there is no narrative here. Um, this is architect, this is, uh, sorry, this is kind of film behaving as a still shot throughout its duration. Um, its particles accumulate in no particular succession, that film. This is a film that is not about succession. Um, and so we are really looking at something that goes against uh, completely uh, the, the natural narrative condition of film. Now, I want to compare that to the most, con that is, so in a way, it's the most radical condition of the filmic medium, when it, it, it absolutely denies what film does, which is operate narratively. Uh, I would compare that in architecture to the least narrative architecture, let's say, uh, the architecture of extrusion. Because for the most part, despite the accumulation of so many successive floors, or successive frames, as it were, nothing happens in these buildings, or very little. Many things are going on in the buildings, but I'm talking about as far as the building itself is concerned. Just as in the film, many things will be happening in the dream life and in the viewer's experience of this eight hours of sleeping, of witnessing sleeping, uh, many fantasies and all sorts of un unimaginable, <laughs> unpredictable things. And that happens in a building like this too. But the building itself, as far as its own structure is concerned, is doing very little to narrate anything. Um, it's open and free to any kind of interpretation, of course. So we see here inactivity. Sleep is architecture disembodied in a way, you could argue. And since most buildings are extruded, or they change without any discernible, you know, powerful change. Uh, I'm sorry, they change only without any kind of very obvious, meaningful change from one level to another, other than to open up or to close certain things. They normally continue. Uh, I think there is some way to, there is some reason to make this comparison, particularly with the very large buildings and towers. So those are four plants of towers. And there is the sleep. And now for the third model, Le Jeté. Film, by the way, it was made in the same year as Warhol's. This one's the most complex one. But I would say it's almost as infrequent in architecture as the anatomical model uh, is, but not quite. And even though it is infrequent, it is much more possible to have it than the anatomical. That's why it's interesting. Now here we have in Chris Marker's film, a kind of description of a memory that's made in uh, successive uh, parts of a film which operate with a certain kind of duration which introduces a series in a way of still shots, still frames in a certain duration with some change, some, some animacy, a certain degree of movement but very little in these successive series of, of of uh, pieces of the film. And so we are looking at kind of gaps. Uh, we might be looking at time sequences with missing pieces of time. Uh, in a way, this is a kind of continuous and discontinuous condition. There are certain underlying meanings that are connecting these, these sets of films, as it were. There are certain subtexts that link them. But we are not witnessing that continuity of a normative film, narrative, filming narrative. I would say the building that is something like that the most would be the Karlsruhe uh, building of Kulhas of the late 80s. Interestingly, this is achieved here because we don't have extrusion, of course. We can't have extrusion. Um, and we have a successive series of spaces piled one on top of another with different structural systems making that possible, different structural truss systems. These are Virendale trusses, 
of different dimensions and typologies, so we get very different plans, one level to the next. Here a plan half dense, half empty. Here a plan divided uh, in one direction, another completely open with uh, centrif centrifugal characteristics, another uh, centralized but bifurcated, uh, again open in the center and only surrounded by density, divided again but in a different way than the earlier one. And so we move through this building as if we are in many buildings. And I think you can see the analogy with the marker, um, a series of films in a film, as it were. Look at that, a circular figure. And of course, the peristyle hall. This is the most expect unexpected, that when we arrive to a hall, a column or hall, a high in a building which until then it had no columns. And so there's a certain kind of disjuncture, uh, sorry, in, in all of this. Um, okay, so what I'm interested in, in a way, looking at is different composites of these planned typologies to look for different possible hybrids and, and new ways of thinking about these models. And I first would argue that this is the, the most conventional in the filmic medium, that the uh, Nanjing Student Center by virtue of the coherence of its overall form, um, represents that kind of condition of slices that are to a certain degree indifferent to the form. I'm gonna run through the plans quickly and you can see how we're cutting horizontally through and we can see how the changes that are exhibited, sorry, relate at all times to the fact that that figure is a single and continuous body. But what's interesting here, and what I think distinguishes this from many of these types of buildings, whereby the slicing is indifferent to the form, is that there, the, within this form, that it should try to contain such a diverse number and type of spaces, and types of spaces, uh, they're breaking up, they're coming apart in very particular ways. It's a very brittle, kind of interior which is somehow resolved through interstitial spaces of a certain kind of interest. And that some of these transformations have really interesting consequences for the way the program is zoned environmentally. There are a whole set of kind of sub, there are kind of uh, localized environmental conditions in here where parts may be heated while others are left unheated in certain periods when those are not in use. And there are systems of ventilation, all kinds of things that strategically operate in the gaps between these pieces that are breaking apart uh, due to the pressure that they stay together in this unified form. So it's true that there's an indifference, but at the same time, the consequences are very precise. And they're allowing for a certain communicability socially between all of these different uh, functions, which are mainly student, student organizations and classrooms and performing spaces. That's a very interesting uh, composite, which results from this compaction in this form that's uh, so striving to contain so much. One of the most interesting things is the way the stair, by being the, one of the fire stairs is pulled out of the tower. This fire stair winds on the outside. There's only one inside the body of the tower. It makes the tower very narrow, exceedingly narrow or unexpectedly narrow allows cross ventilation to be much more effective, but also gives a figurative presence to this slender tower that otherwise we wouldn't have. Now, I think Tel Aviv is an interesting composite, unlike that one, which was more straightforwardly the anatomical. I think Tel Aviv, I would argue, is a kind of, imagine you implant a kind of anatomical plan inside of the Legete model. So you have the Legete, Watch how we have a pile of plans of very different characteristics and organizations. Here we are at the top of the building with these very large rectangular galleries in the front part. And as we descend the building, we're going to go down now. The plan immediately below this is that. It's a completely different order, very different kind of structural system. And we descend again. We have another kind of system. And when we get to the bottom of the building, we're at 45 degrees on this side for the first time, whereas in the earlier plans, you will see that that angle didn't exist. We had this kind of angle which is between the 90 and the 45. And at the top, this normative system which is related to the context. By the way, all of that is subsumed in a body which has turned slightly so that 
very interestingly, as you move in from the existing building, this is the orthogonal of the existing building. It comes in there, but the, the, the whole of the building is slightly turned. And you can see that this angle, this orthogonality that represents itself that way here is slightly out of axis with everything else. So that, that had to do with the heavy wheel that turned to make the entry uh, into the garden. The whole building turns and twists in a certain way, the facade, so that this, this spiraling sequence is developed at the perimeter of the building. But leaving that detail out of it, I was trying to say something about the plan before I got distracted. And I would say that it's interesting to find that. And then at the same time, to know that this is that light well. There it is in this plan. Here it is in this plan, that diamond shape. And it changes, of course, according to the rotating of the spaces around it. Always we're slicing through it arbitrarily. And so it is much like the Guggenheim in that sense that the cutting of the plan is arbitrary to the geometry of that figure. We cannot represent in any accurate or useful way that, uh, that innermost space. It has to be drawn in by other means, by the way, obviously. Um, and here we have a kind of representation of the entire pileup of structural systems um, that enabled packing so many programs and getting this kind of spaces at the perimeter. We would like to give life to the building on the perimeter, unlike other museums, which are mute and silent at, the, at their edges and usually segregate uh, all of their everyday functions to a centralized position, a tower or a wing. We are mixing all kinds of curatorial office spaces, many public elements like the library and study center and the restaurant. All of those things on the perimeter populate these interesting gaps, uh, gain the kind of shadows they need in the site, you know, uh, escaping that uh, in the extreme heat of the very heavy, the very difficult sun here. And it's, it's, it's all part of this question of negotiating the many functions in the sequence. So I think it's kind of in that model of the, of the Bermonte being faced with the problem of the site that forced him to adopt a, an interesting solution. Um, and at the same time, it has its kind of internal logic. Um, I should say that that condition of the multiplicity of different plans is particularly conducive here of the way in which this building is, is used because it's a kind of community center as much as it is a museum. There are children's programs, elderly programs, study center, restaurant with very different kinds of, of uh, durations, uh, different kinds of sequences and protocols and security, uh, closing, opening hours, uh, very complex interactions. Um, and it is useful to have the freedom to have them develop independent of each other without the, the, the regiment of a extruded plan. Um, so here you can see how these are flying above at some angle completely off that and that and so forth. Finally, uh, the last of these museum, uh, th the projects in which we could say something about these plan models and how they operate at the Taiyuan, I think what happens, which is different than Tel Aviv, is that because it is such a big building, this one is 320,000 square feet, Tel Aviv is just about at the top in terms of size before you really get into trouble. It's, it's 200,000. But when you go beyond that, you can't keep everything controlled by a central space. You can't any longer have a kind of coherent vision from within the building without resorting to really oversized atria and stuff, things like that. We do have an oversized atrium. We were required to have it. I'm not happy about that, but I, I think we've done some things to develop the space to overcome uh, that uh, experience of centralization that becomes too dominant with the atriums. But what I wanted to say was that the, the problem here was to have clusters of galleries, again, integrated with many other programs auditoriums, libraries, all kinds of things, but more than one library, oddly enough. Um, and to find ways to alternate sequences that are continuous, uh, much like Guggenheim, Tel Aviv, uh, 
but uh, to alternate those with succession so that one can skip and go from one level to another uh, and have the freedom to make those choices. So this is a building, and I would have to take you through it in too much detail, and it would be too tedious in a lecture to tell you everything, but it's a building about the dialectic between chronology and non-chronology in a museum. Whereas I would say the other museum, Tel Aviv, is more the dialectic between spectacle, public space, and, and contemplative and very kind of uh, sequestered ex exhibition areas. Um, and so they have a different kind of dialectic, um, and each of them needs a different way to be resolved in, in terms of its circulation. Um, so I think it's very interesting to understand what is the question facing the museum today. Let's say it has to do with this question of the didactic nature of a chronology versus uh, a scattering and arbitrary uh, distribution ver or the spectacular and visual uh, formal space, which is a distraction from uh, neutral and, and indifferent spaces. Uh, these kinds of questions that are pressing on museums about what their values are and what directions they wish to go. Um, you all know too well that so many museums suffered uh, in the last 10 years after Bilbao uh, from succumbing to architectural inventions that ignored uh, the deeper uh, programmatic um, debates. Um, I'm trying to work through these and still offer buildings to the city that perform on other levels. Um, and I think these plans with their kind of hybridity are, are a good instrument for doing that. Um, I'll just point out one of the things that happens here. We, we, we can come in in many places. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a building with more than one threshold. I'm not used to having to do that, but we were asked to. And you wind up, but as you wind up through this building, you're threading uh, back into galleries like this one, and then you come back out again into the atrium, and then you continue up, and then you disappear. Well, you continue up in an askew here, and you continue here into these. I would say that some of these things, the fact this skews off this is, is very compelling because, for example, when you're in the lower level, you can see that this path continues, but you cannot take that path in its visual continuity. One proceeds to move through the building along paths that are not as continuous as they are visually inscribed. And so the visual inscription of movement and the actual promenade, the physical movement, are not correspondent. It's a little bit related to the anamorphic idea, but it is the result of the, of the superposition of interestingly varied plans. And we can see that in section, something like this happens again. Now here we really are back at the anatomical. Look how anatomical this is. Uh, where any cut seems random, arbitrary, and one of many with no uh, determining value. No section of this building is the section from which springs the space of this building. It is only the result of cutting there and only there. Um, but it defines, by the way, a structural member. Every single one of these is a true view of a structural uh, membering system in the building and has to be delivered that way to the engineer. Now we will see an animacy of one wing of the building only out of the seven wings that are defined in that very dynamic form. The problem has interesting implications, by the way, for the role of, of architecture in the protocols relative to construction, that when you build these anatomical, when you build these bodies, these forms of such unusual shape, uh, rearrangements in the way in which the services are delivered are, are due. And we were having to do, go much deeper and to do working drawings all the way to the very conclusion in both of these buildings in ways that we would not allow for collaborations with local architects because it would have created impossible uh, uh, differences in the process and delays. So we have had to adopt our own means to grow into taking buildings all the way through construction um, due to the, the anatomical model. So finally, just as, as a kind of concluding element, the question of geometry and tectonics that I said that I would speak about 
um, and which is, of course, perhaps the most profound of them because it is the moment when architecture comes to its conclusion and is finally a fixed condition, transcending all of the ideas brought to it. And we can see here a very beautiful way of, I think, I hope, for making uh, these curves out of uh, independent parts. These are precast panels that are manufactured in the building, actually, and lifted out of it. The building is <laughs> feeding itself its facade. Uh, <laughs> and these are, let's say, in the vicinity of 200 to 300 square foot each, these panels. There are 460 different shapes. They're made by casting on tables, smooth steel tables in the building, and magnets are moved on these tables so that the variable shapes and angles of the edges can be created without having to build all these different formworks. So there is a standardization within this process. Um, these are reinforced, and they are the building. I mean, we are not dealing with cladding here. These are hung directly on this steel, on these steel ribs. And so the paneling, this kind of panelization of the curve, builds up a set of lineaments and the distortion and illusions that are very anamorphic or implicit here. Um, you could see, for example, how here this culminates in a straight line. These diverse surfaces culminate in a straight line, despite, of course, their different trajectories. Um, this is the ramped entry as the building rotated to allow you go to enter into the garden, which is beyond that point. That's the garden back there. You can see how the building is made of these large sloped uh, parallelograms, much like those that were inside the light well, which were open for viewing. Here they're solid, <coughs> but they're analogous to the uh, light well. Um, I think what I would emphasize here is that the tensions that mount when the skin of the building needs to have continuity uh, despite construction, the limits of construction, produces an interesting, um, uh, an interesting second effect, which is the, the particular way in which assembly uh, gives evidence to the process of, of working on this project, which is, of course, a huge and collective undertaking. So there's a kind of social dimension. There's a kind of aspiration. It's a very particular condition to this place that concrete can be made that way so finely. Uh, really very beautifully. And here we have the cast in place, which is quite a different thing on the inside. So all I would conclude, and I didn't really have a conclusion except that I would say something like that I think, <laughs> that I'm hoping that architecture under these conditions produces evidence of the fundamental forces and the resonances and, and social meanings that accumulate into shapes and figures in forms that are vital, not ancillary, to the demands put upon them. And I would caution only that I think we are today, perhaps in my view, too empiricist and ahistoricist in our leanings uh, in describing things only in technical terms. And I would hope that the question of meaning and the resonances of our forms can be something we continue to pay as much attention to as we did in past periods. With that provocation, I'll conclude and ask if you have any questions. Thanks so much. Can you say something about um, the intersection between your level of intention as an architect and what began to happen in that huge shift in scale and the necessity to grapple with a very, very complex social dimension of the cultures in which you're building and also the kind of constructional techniques that have to be mustered to make that scale leap? Yeah. Well, um, 
I think where the continuity is, despite appearances, oddly enough, is in the connection to the, the clients. And the clients of small buildings and the clients of large buildings, some buildings, such as civic institutions, have clients on the best occasions that have a certain kind of dedication to a, the idea of a vision for the building, which is somewhat like the, the house client, a special house client. The, the client for that house in upstate New York was so intensely embedded in this thing and so difficult in a wonderful way, as it turns out, but impossible while it was happening. I mean, <laughs> it was almost nightmarish to try to deal with the phone calls at 4 a.m. But, I mean, this was somebody who cared so much and had really strong ideas about what architecture does in life. And I think the same for this curator in, um, the head chief curator, Moti Omer in Israel. If you get involved in that kind of social, in that connection to the idea of who these people are and how their role shapes and pushes back on, on architecture, how that constant negotiation plays out, the difference isn't that great really at a fundamental level. Of course, then the question of construction, um, I would say that, how would I say what the differences were? It really happened, it evolved into this problem. I mean, you know, the engineer stepped in and the structural question was new here in a scale that it hadn't faced. It's interesting what you're asking. I, I don't feel there's so much discontinuity though at some deep level. I'm reminded, by the way, as I'm saying this, of, uh, the, of an architect named Olgiati, Valerio Olgiati, who's now teaching at Harvard. And he told me that, you know, he's giving this big project to a big school of architecture for the students. And he said the question he asked students is, do you want to design a house? And if they don't have a desire to design a house, they can't be an architect from, from his point of view. And I think there's something very uh, compelling about that. It, it has something to do with being able to integrate things at a very deep level. It's a very personal connection people have to their houses. It's a very deeply, uh, well, it's a very complex thing. Um, it's not just architectural. And the rooms are all variable. It's a complicated entity, a house, in a certain way that many buildings are not. And the museums are like that too. They have very special and different kinds of spaces in them. I don't know what I will do or if I have to handle the question of something that doesn't have those characteristics. Let's say something like a tower. It's not really something, it doesn't interest me that much. So I would have to make it interesting somehow. Force it to become interesting. But um, I don't know, I don't know if that helps at all. Question out there. Um, all right, so you're, in your projects referring to the narrative, um, what are your primary means of representation to design these things where they look almost sculptural, 3D model-esque, they're about plan but not about plan, they're about section, not about section. Do you have a primary means of representation to design your spatial narrative? You mean during design or to represent how I design? In, in your design work, not to represent it, but you're trying to, to figure out for yourself what oh, you're yeah. doing. Definitely. It's modeling, 3D modeling, computer modeling. I rarely make a physical model to figure something out. Because the, the physical model, there are two problems with physical model. It, it's, it's either made as a copy of drawings, in a way. You, you draw the shapes, you cut them out. Well, you can laser cut them. I mean, you still have the, you know, still have the process of the assembly to deal with. But uh, it's basically a replica of the computer model or of, draw of flat drawings. Uh, so it comes after the fact anyway. So it's a representation of the process rather than really the process. Or the model, if it is something other than that. It's something on its own that you make and you look at or observe or inspired to make things out from regardless of any drawing that preceded it. It, it is just its own thing. I don't tend to uh, be attracted to that idea of architecture. And one of the reasons, uh, and this is a longer discussion, but I would say, first of all, I, I, I think it's an obstacle course. So the, the model interferes for me with a very clear-minded way of thinking about architecture because it has its own characteristics which are not the characteristics of buildings and not the characteristics of the way we make things in buildings. I mean, they, they operate materially so differently. 
the actual tectonics of models have nothing to do with the tectonics of building scale. And so when we have many architects in the 70s and 80s who made buildings out of models, they were atectonic. Or they were confused tectonically in a very bad way, I think. And some of that is the legacy of this confusion about the role of the model. Some of the bad postmodern and deconstruction, I believe, originated it. And by the way, a confusion about the role of drawings and models. I'm sorry to say, because I love the materials we work with, but they had, I believe, uh, were misinterpreted. So anyway, I'm very happy to have the computer modeling because it's the most direct and clear, and tr it's just so lucidly able to move from concept to material and to operate at a scale which is constantly changing. Uh, completely abstracted, atectonic, it can be, or already anticipating the numerology and logic of the structural performance of things and being able to look, be looked at in perceptually relatively accurate ways, perspectively, and it's fantastic. Of course, you can make a copy of it instantly in a model, three-dimensional physical model, and we do it, not instantly. I mean, it's a <laughs> that's a long process. And we made some great models, but they're very arduous, and they're for representations for the client, for exhibitions. So here's my... Of course, some people say you took the tactility out of it, you know, because you're only working with computer modeling. But I think the tactility of architecture resides in its construction, frankly. That's my answer to that. I have a question, Scott, that I think follows on that and your answer, that, that the computer model is your primary mode of generation, I guess you'd say. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> something like that. That's slightly different, but go ahead. Um, Generation. Well, that, Making, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Back up. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the question's about the, the typology of plans. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering if, you know, combining plan, these sort of idiosyncratic notion typologies of plan with film is a way to come up with some sort of uh, typology of, of digital modeling that is explicitly, you know, by combining animation essentially and hmm. and plans that really can't be understand understood except as part of a, a, a three-dimensional model, that there's some project there to uh -huh. come up with a new typology that's appropriate to the way you work. Well, I, first of all, you're reminding me when by using that word generation and the question that was asked of it, I left out something and I have to right before I answer this, it's very important. Strangely enough, there is one other way of doing things that's super important, which is drawing by hand. And I, 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 I come, there's a problem that I remember so well exactly that the problem of, for example, chronology and non-chronology and the Tai Yuan, I, I figured it out just by drawing little, you know, plants, I, just struggling by hand for days and days and days, drawing little pieces of plants that were stuck together and it was, really hard to figure out. Um, I, I had to draw some in the free hand and then we're piling boxes up and looking at them also in the model but I have to say a drawing by hand has a role somewhere in there. Uh, some projects I don't draw at all by hand by the way also but I, there, there, it depends how tight the Gordian knot. Um, as far as this idea, I think the thing that I would think about first is scripting which I didn't talk about either which is, of course, the main frontier for us now. Um, no doubt about that. And I'm not yet there. I mean, you know, frankly, there are people in the office that are doing different parts of the projects through scripting. Um, and then we are in a very inefficient way of generating all these drawings. We should not be doing it this way. We're very regressive, I would say, in the way we're, we're developing a lot of this because of the speed with which we're being asked to do it. We don't have time to invest in the scripting, but someday we think that won't have to be so arduous. I, I feel like we're behind the curve on this whole matter. But that's where it's going to be, I think, uh, the writing of form, uh, which by other means than uh, we've known, um, that you would have this possibility of, an, of a shift to another medium, another medium of thought. I don't know if particularly whether the filmic medium is the one to think about that way. I understand, of course, that if we can't underestimate power of the filmic medium to be manipulable 
in design because you can envision architecture through movement and through um, form represented that way. That's such a compelling means, you know, if you can bring it into an environment, a computational environment in a certain way, right? You know, it's just super powerful. I don't know where we're going to be with that. And then we would be cutting that to make drawings of it, or to make it tectonic. That would be scripted. There's, there are levels of animacy that are just so high and that we are going to be reaching, already have reached, that are so exceed everything that I'm doing. Um, I couldn't possibly claim to be a harbinger of this or to be the main leader of any of this. Um, I have to live with the reality that I'm in an older, I'm in a bygone era already. You all are in the new, you're, you're going to the next level. <laughs> I will be done for very soon. <laughs> Architecture is always facing its impending obsolescence. <laughs> it's frozen at every moment in a state of obsolescence. Yes. Scott. Uh, um, another friend. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's great to see you present your, your recent work. And, and I've, I've been quite intrigued by how it advances in certain kind of legible levels your earlier work, but I'm also intrigued now that you're here presenting it to maybe understand that a bit better. Um, and, you know, whereas in your earlier work there was a very clear, I would say, interrelationship between the act of drawing, the, the, the sort of strange and beautiful complexities of, of projective geometry as you extrapolated them, and a kind of grounded experience of those projects. Um, and today you didn't so much theorize the geometry of these newer projects, but I'm guessing there's a lot there. Where you did, it was so much in the kind of categorization of plan and, and in these couple answers about the role of the digital model. Is there still a, a, an explicit trace of that earlier work here? Or how would you say in a couple sentences, I know it's a much larger conversation, but how would you say perhaps in a couple sentences how that trace remains or how maybe more you explicitly advance that or how the immerse, immersion in the digital model perhaps altered that project? I see it all the time. It's so funny. I mean, we were just, like, for example, the, I don't have some of the old houses to show you, but like the, the, the Nanjing, the Performing Arts Center, it's so much like this house that was called Cornered House long, long ago, the obliques in it. It has something to do with the sustenance, the maintenance of certain linear elements, all of them have, that are rigid according to their endings, <laughs> according to the points that they must connect. And there's something about their adherence to a relationship to each other in those points. Um, and there is a kind of insistence on that. I, and formally, there are so many resemblances that I could also talk to. They all sort of come back to certain kind of spiraling motions, whether they're formally manifested or in terms of the movements. They're, they're all connected. I, I, I don't see the, it's funny, I don't see the discontinuity. I don't have to make claims or argue about it any, I don't feel compelled to do that. I don't think it's that interesting, really, frankly, strangely enough. I mean, it's interesting when you're working on it, but it doesn't connect to what really matters, which is how that is going to be a student-centered in that kind of place, which is difficult to make a place in. Um, and overcoming that is really what it's about. And my own formal interests have to do with creating sensations that are I, in, ineffable and that help that. But uh, I don't think theorizing in a very geometric way helps to explain, you know. It, it's a tough call. You know, there's an architectural audience for these things, and there's a the public, and uh, as you go into the public, you're interested in the public's interests, and then you're, you feel okay about your geometries, and you don't need any more to deal with them in a, in a, you know, a kind of obsessive, self-obsessed uh, uh, way, I, I think, I hope. I mean, that's kind of a little psychoanalysis there <laughs> of why I don't do it. And maybe it's not advancing as much because of that, but I think what, what advances is how this interfaces with the larger institutions and, you know, I want to see how architecture changes institutions. I'm more interested in that right now. Um, anyway, I hope it's okay. I mean, when I'm teaching with you, when I'm teaching, of course, I get into it, but I don't think I'm as sharp as I was. I mean, you know, when I'm teaching, I, I, I think I'm, I'm softer about my, I'm not as tuned to the precision 
uh, that I used to be. So I have other people helping to be uh, closer readers, and I, I need to keep uh, sharpening. Yeah. <laughs> I still think it's important, but uh, I can't do it as much as I did. <laughs> I don't. This question may build on the next uh, on the last one, and sort of given your answer about. Uh, complex drawing over, over modeling, which you empirically look at to s see something, but it's got so many of its own sort of yeah. ripple effects. Would, you, would it be fair to argue, especially given the anamorphotic introduction and the attenuation, which is really a tension between two two-dimensional conditions yeah. as they relate to each other, and then you end up with this construction detail at the end, which is similarly, uh, our knowledge of it is understood as two-dimensional conditions put into torsion, yeah. that the role of two-dimensionality is actually the most theoretical moment in the work, mm -hmm. even though in the various torsions it produces these highly difficult to understand three-dimensional spaces. And yes. I'm just curious, what is the role of two-dimensional drawing in either your teaching or your work? Because uh, as I was trying to follow those plans and how they stack and looking for the above and below indications, I couldn't find them easily, but it was too fast. They're uh, in there. I know they're, I know they're <laughs> in there, but it, it, I it, hear you. it suddenly reminded me yeah. that it's like the, the role of two-dimensional representation and cognition in producing very complex three-dimensional spaces seems to never be lost, yes. either at the construction end or the theoretical end from your intro. I, I think that's a super important thing, and that is maybe what makes my work, as I characterize it, uh, you know, I shouldn't, but I, I don't believe it when I say it's regressive, because I, do th I, I don't think problems in architecture can be measured according to a kind of Hegelian progress, you know, progression, uh, a sense of progress. But, um, leaving that question of historicity out of it. Um, yeah, the 2D, uh, what's, what's interesting, and I think you're right about the theorization issue, is that it's a kind of a priori and a posteriori condition because it's, let's say, after the fact that we have to flatten these curves into all their discrete parts, or after the fact some of those plans are cut which aren't really offering any information about construction because they're just synonymous with other parts of plan which are useful. For example, when we slice through the Tel Aviv, it's saying everything about the size of the galleries, their precise positions, and nothing about that form in the middle that's of any use. It's just our, it's useless lines at that moment. But um, so some are resultant, some are after, like the translation to flat from curved, and some are a priori, like the plan. Um, Theory then is proceeds and comes through interpretation after the fact. We theorize, you know, retroactively what we've done. I think the two-dimensional is something like that process of, you know what I mean, beginning and ending with it, um, with the, the interpretive act. Um, that, that movement back and forth from two to three is clearly a, a, a long-standing interest that I've had. Um, because I think architecture is an object of cognition, as you put it very well, as a kind of something in the imagination of the observer, uh, as much as it is a series of effects and physical realities which are just sensationally uh, exper experienced. Um, it's difficult to know very much about this cognitive component because, I mean, how it's received, how it's um, absorbed by non-architects. We, have, we struggle with this, and so we tend to give up on them because we expect they are not understood. Um, I would say you should not give up on them, though, because they have tremendous effects, despite the unconscious relationship that people have with these tightly elaborated <laughs> things. Um, anyway, yes? That nicely leads to the question I had. We have a lot of people doing thesis and thesis prep right now, so yeah. it's all about making arguments, right? Making arguments. Arguments. So yeah. there is the argument, and then there is the methodology that gets you to the project. Yeah. And especially in museum projects, and I had the opportunity to, to work on a large museum project for a while, the MFA in Boston. And knowing how difficult it is to make an argument, and you know, looking at the geometry you're proposing, the spatial consequences, um, how do you communicate that? And how do you get people that really don't have that spatial understanding to agree to programmatic and spatial consequences they probably don't quite get? 
because I think it's it's a lot of students are in this position right now. They think, don't you see what I'm doing? Don't you see what I'm doing? <laughs> and then what ties into that is when you get into construction, um, in question. terms of digital workflow, yeah. and that is that is a long discussion to have. <coughs> how that ties back to um, that process. Oof. Well, wha one of the things that I would say is that we often are dedicated to a process or an idea, an argument, so strongly, and it produces things that we ourselves don't like, but that we stay with and that we believe in because we have undertaken our arguments and our processes. I mean, how many people have followed a process and ended up with a design they just didn't, it, either they didn't care what it looked like or they thought it was awful, but that it had succeeded in achieving its rigor, and so they stuck it out. I mean, and there's a lot of that, I think. I, I've gone through many periods of doing works that I reject with my judgment, but accept with my sense of uh, valor, with my sense of dedication to something else, which is abstract. Uh, um, so I, uh, hmm. the question is whether others should have to do that, too, you know? <laughs> others involved in the endeavor of architecture, other than ourselves and our own problems with our dedications. Um, and I think we have to be wary and uh, skeptical of ourselves, even if we're dedicated to something. I think you have to be both uh, committed and, and, and critical. I'd say that first. And then the other point would be about, oh, how do you get other people to agree? Or, that's interesting. Um, I mean, I have to tell you, for example, in the Tel Aviv, you know, there were many things great and wonderful, and they were right. They were seen as right and great. And then, you know, the plans are coming, and, and the director's going, hell is this? What is a horrible space? What's wasting it? What are you doing with me? How did you get with this? How did I end up with this? We didn't discuss this. I mean, he didn't know some of these places were in there. How, how could he have known that they would turn out that way? Uh, because they, uh, I didn't even know it at a certain point. So I, he forced me to go back and account for things. You know? um, there, there's little unaccounted for now because he, he noticed that this was happening. The things were escaping from critical uh, attention <laughs> because of some belief that it had to be. But, um, well, anyway, I think you've heard me now on that. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a very good question. Very, very good. Yeah. Okay, one more. We're, we're a little over an hour now. I'm going to try to, I don't want to tire anyone. That's the key, not to make it go. I just boring. had a quick yeah. question. Um, there seemed to be a large amount of representation within your presentation of. Um, the structural component and the construction process of your buildings. I guess what I'm really interested in is to what degree does that really inform your theoretical approach to this, um, mm. your design? Because it seems to be, you seem to focus on it a lot within your what you're showing us. Mm, uh, yeah, mm, that's a good one too. Um, yeah. Well, okay, I know this may sound not true, but it is. You'll have to trust me. There were no really nice plans drawn ever, you know, of any of them. They were always kind of in a state of messy, you know, or just inconclusive, uh, inconclusiveness. It, it never was a clean thing. And even the layering is chaotic. We, we, when we take it, it's not that it's chaotic. It's just that when you take it into Illustrator, everything is on layers according to color. There's a lot of reasons we have trouble parsing out things. So we just decided to put everything on a single layer except the cut lines. Uh, there's actually three layers. There's things below, the, there's the cut, there's the things below the cut, and then there's all the construction information. So these three layers make the drawings, and then we erase some of the construction stuff when it just gets too hairy. We select some of them and just erase it randomly. It's not really very systematic. But um, the fuzz, obviously the fuzzy uh, information, all of that data, all that stuff is, is well, I like the way it looks. I'm seduced by it. It's, it, it signifies uh, all that went into it. I like that. I like seeing the traces of all the work of the people that have made this building. Just knowing all of that is there is beautiful. I don't like cleaning it out and making it, you know, abstract. And then also, um, it does help you see where the cuts are for those sections, you know, to have that information. Um, I think, though, as far as design now, I mean, really and truly, you know, we have to think about the thicknesses and distributions and sizes of the, I mean, all of this is in my head when we draw things, it, much, of course, more than it was when I started. It's the kind of thing you know now that when you design certain things, you're going to get all these, well, columns and stuff, 
mechanicals, you know, you're going to have problems. So it starts to be already in your mind early on. But I think these drawings are more just the result, frankly, of not minding and liking seeing the process and not wanting to clean it up, both for practical reasons <laughs> and for some ideological reasons. Yeah, I like to show it. I think it's nice. Anyway, Great. okay, thank well, you much. thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.